Merci, Laurent. Thank you for having a, giving me a reason to come to Paris. Though I was lucky to come in on Friday when it was beautiful weather. So today I'm going to talk about the audio revolution, US, Europe, and China. Growing up in Finley, Ohio, I spent my summers reading to my grandmother, who was blind. She would also read to me, her fingers flying over the braille. And throughout the summer afternoons, the world was opened up to me of books, and we went to magical places together. So when I ended up working in publishing in New York, I was delighted to have my love of books and my love of the spoken word come together as the audio revolution took place. Because as we know, a great voice telling a great story and sharing knowledge really is truly inspiring for the soul. In the last few years, the di digital revolution has really hit audiobooks, as it has become so easy to listen on the go for your hectic lifestyle, in the car, jogging, and even lulled to sleep at bedtime. A couple of us were talking about that. You put on your audiobook at night, and now there's a little timer, 15 minutes, and then I'll go to sleep. So it's amazing how easy it's become. And the effect, of course, has been to sell a lot of audiobooks. In the United States, we've seen double-digit increases for the last six years. And so the di digital download has grown in share of revenue 123% from 2013 to 2017. And of course, in the digital audiobook space, the sales now have hit $3.2 billion, up 38% this past year. Or, you know, and, and in the United States, audiobook listeners are do, listening to an average of 15 books a year. It's really been phenomenal success due to the ease and innovation of content and technology coming together. And now it's attracting a lot of young people. The majority of 45% of, of the purchases are available, have been purchased by people age 45 and below. And 57% of audiobooks are read at home, the APA has found, and 32% of people listen in their cars. And the transformation of tech increases audiobook consumption. Forbes did an article last year on audiobooks and of course commented that people are reading more and more audiobooks and it's clearly due to the ease of access through increased uh, improvements in technology. 73% of listeners use their smartphone to listen to at least one audiobook in 2018. 47% of listeners chose a smartphone for their listening device on a regular basis. I know for me, I, I live a lot of the time on the subway in New York City, and it's so easy to read ebooks and listen to audiobooks on the go, whereas before, you know, I would have been carrying a, a book, a heavy book with me. And in the UK, 49% of audiobook buyers consider themselves heavy buyers, and that's 16 or more audiobooks a year. Publishers have confirmed that one in 10 books are sold in the audio format. And the increase of original content and great new productions has made a great difference to bringing in new listeners and were great word of mouth. Uh, here's an example of John Cleese's audiobook. I don't know how many of you were fond of Monty Python, but the audiobook has been augmented with archival information about Monty Python and improvisations from John Cleese and ended up winning a nonfiction audio award. In China, ebook reading is continuing to go up this past year. Now, in China, it's harder to get numbers of sales because most of the companies are privately held. So they don't really want to tell you any numbers. But each year, the Chinese Academy of Press and Publications does a survey of reading. And here they found this past year that the average number of books that the Chinese adults say they read, obviously it's a, it's a self-reported, is eight books a year, with 41% of them being e-books this past year. And audiobooks are on the rise in China. Here you see the steady increase. 
And of course, it's similar to what's happening in, in the US and in Europe. The busy lifestyle makes audiobooks very appealing. In China, there's a really great interest in self-education and self-improvement now in the market. And of course, the ease of access for the Chinese really sort of leaps, leapfrogged the US and Europe as far as not even going into computers, they went right to the smartphone. So they, uh, if you ever go to China or deal with any Chinese, you can do everything on WeChat and WePay by, owned by Tencent. And here it's when they did their survey, the Chinese adults um, say they listen on the apps, they listen on the radio to audiobooks, and they listen on WeChat voice. And audiobooks really are growing the market. I think we've always felt that ebooks was more of a substitution for physical books. But audiobooks brings that special magic of a great narrator and the new content and innovative productions. So it's bringing in new listeners. Of course, there is that concern of cannibalization as people find it easier to listen to a book than actually read. And we were interested a few years ago, the New York Times started an audiobook bestseller list. So monthly they report on this, and Pamela Paul, editor of the New York Times Book Review, of course, here is quoted saying that they wanted to have a more accurate information about the sales, so they have been collecting it from the main vendors. And the audiobook gold rush, of course, brings new vendors and consolidation. As no surprise here, Amazon's ebook and e-reader strategy dominated the ebook market, and they've done the same for the audiobook market. I was fortunate when I worked at Random House, Random House invested in Audible early on. So in 2001, I would venture out to a strip mall in New Jersey and watch what Audible was doing and help them with content and with marketing. So I was fascinated, of course, in 2008 when Amazon bought Audible. And then with their incredible distribution innovations and a very fairly low priced subscription that they had, were able to start early on and keep and aggressive deals with the publishers and good marketing, they really have taken over the industry in the United States. And here you can see some of the innovations that they have made. Uh, you may be aware of the audiobook exchange, content exchange, which they launched in 2011. And it was so successful bringing together narrators, content owners, and producers that after one year, Audible said it gave them more content than their top three providers previously. And of course, in 2012, they launched WhisperSync. And that allowed you to read your Kindle and move to listening. So if you went from your car to the house, you could move easily back and forth. And also immersion reading. So here you could also read along, listen along as you read the book. These, of course, seemed revolutionary in 2012. But now with the launch of smart speakers in 2015, it's given Amazon and Audible a great step up in that market. And other things that they've done recently, interestingly, not surprisingly, they brought in great uh, famous celebrities to read the books. And of course, these are not available to other vendors. So they're doing a lot of proprietary ebooks and audiobooks that makes it impossible to uh, share in the marketplace. And they have started uh, doing original content. It did grow a lot. And then recently, they did lay off their head of content and scaled back on their podcasting that they had started a few years ago. So it'll be interesting to see what's next there. But they are giving away Audible Originals, and they're doing a lot of live theater productions in New York that they record and then put on Audible, again, exclusive to Audible. And they're giving two a month if you're a, a subscriber to keep you there. Um, we were always surprised Apple didn't do better. They had an early agreement with Audible pre-Amazon. So they were the sort of warehouse in a way for downloading of Audible uh, audiobooks. Of course, Europe actually brought it to attention of the, the world that it was a little anti-competitive. So they did step away from that in 2017. And now with the end of iTunes, we're excited to see what Apple's going to do with building the audiobook market for themselves. And of course, they're extra motivated by the smart speaker market. 
Kobo entered audiobooks a couple years ago, and they're actually doing audio, uh, Kobo originals now, focusing more in, on Europe uh, and Canada. And Google got into the space uh, quite late last year. And of course, they probably got in because of the smart speaker market. And they're advertising no subscription. So uh, that's their competitive advantage, they hope. Um, in the US, uh, the library market is very large. And of course, it's been a concern for publishers about the cannibalization. And when I started working with digital library, it was very clunky. So if you had a library card in New York City, you could go online. But it took, I think it was 18 steps to download load an audiobook. So the publishers, I think, felt a little safer in that it was so hard to do. Um, but now all the vendors have made it much easier. Here's an example of Overdrive's Libby, which makes it a two-step process to download an audiobook. But of course, they do have, we do have the model where it's one file, one user, so there are long wait lines, but Libby now tells you how long you'll have to wait for the audiobook. And of course, mergers and consolidation has followed. In 2017, audiobooks.com, which was the largest competitor to Audible, though quite far behind, uh, was acquired by RB Media, a new conglomerate of recorded books. And they got a lot of funding and, and moved to Australia and UK quite aggressively, and maybe they were just doing that to get ready for a sale, because they were then sold in July to KKR, the big equity firm. I have this quote here from Richard Sarnoff, who was my boss and mentor at Random House, and he ran Random House Ventures for years. And of course, he says, audiobooks create incremental time for enjoying great books, and one thing we lack today is time. So they expect the market to keep growing, of course. And of course, jets, uh, the jet propel, propul propulsion of smart speakers in the audio revolution. We're really seeing it in the states where 41% uh, of, uh, of people have now smart or voice activated speakers. So you can sit at home and, and say, you know, I'd like to listen to the audiobook of Pride and Prejudice. And the positives, of course, is it's bringing people together. You can sit in your living room and listen to an audiobook with others. And uh, the ease of it, again, at bedtime to listen to an audiobook makes it much more inviting. But not surprisingly, Amazon has already 66% of the market. And smart speakers are expected to grow by 2020, more than doubling. And it will change very much search. Because search now, uh, as people move to the smart voice-activated speakers, search will become much more about voice-activated search. And the exciting thing, of course, for publishers is the new smart speakers allows this interesting ability to create content that's interactive. So here's just a couple examples. The BBC created an interactive uh, make-your-own-adventure with a, a company in, in the, the UK. And so you can create your own narrative with question and answers to your smart speaker. Hachette recently created one for the young, young child, young, like young market, children's market. And here they have a choose your own adventure with their very popular Classroom 13 series. And of course, it's also made this exciting new market for short form. So a number of the publishers are slicing and dicing their audiobooks and creating original content for their authors that will just go out in short form. And not surprisingly, inspirational daily affirmations, self-help advice, and Christian devotionals work very well. The publishers have started adding calls to action to try to get people to then buy the book. Those have not worked quite as well. And of course, uh, Laurent nicely shared with me a recent uh, joint study about the concerns about competition, uh, that it will be a real problem in the world and in Europe, how Amazon, Google, and Apple control the smart speaker market at this point. So there will have to be a lot of uh, government oversight to make sure they don't uh, only share their content, which is a big problem. And spoken word goes into podcasting. And we've had podcasts for years, but suddenly it's, it's so exciting. And of course, it's so exciting because it's so easy to listen now on your cell phone, on your smart speaker. 
Here's some interesting statistics about podcasting in the US. And there was 750,000 podcasts in the US last, this past year. And I've been so struck, every company and friend of mine is like, I'm gonna create a podcast. But of course, the reality is one thing to create, it's another to do you know, daily or weekly content that interests people that they come back. So a lot of the podcasts start up and then stop. And here, 38 million podcasts, or more than 38 million podcasts, are downloaded each week this, in, this year, in 2019. Apple reported a record 50 billion downloads in 2018, up from just under 14 billion in 2017. But of course, great podcasts are very entertaining, but now everyone's saying, how can we make money? So there is uh, the different models that have been coming up. Free is a gateway to purchase. Advertising supported, donation supported, National Public Radio has a lot of great, very popular podcasts, subscription, micropayments, which works very well in China because it's so easy to pay little amounts on your phone. Tipping, Himalaya.com is testing that in the US, a new podcasting service that is largely funded by a Chinese company. And free podcasts are a great way to get people interested. So even in the audiobook space, Audible, Overdrive, and Scribd have all launched their own podcasts. And it gets people excited to hear a little bit. And then the strategy, of course, it excites them to buy more and to sign up for the subscriptions. Podcasts can also convert to sales. Here's an example where the publicist and the publisher were thrilled how well the book sold and pre-sold because the man, Mike Duncan, has, a very po has two very popular podcasts. And platforms innovate, of course, to make it easier now in the podcasting space. Spotify is making it a little too easy <laughs> to download everything in your subscription. And just now in June, they added to their podcasting ease of download and access, separating out episodes, downloads, and shows. They've also added the first playlist that incorporates podcasts and a web app so you can create your own podcast. So we may be looking at another million podcasts coming out this year. <laughs> and hardware, how to track and see how much people are listening in their car to podcasts. Of course, investors have come in strong in the podcasting market. Uh, Luminary uh, launched in April 2019, and I find it kind of funny, they all launched, they say, with $100 million in investment. Uh, so this one, they're emphasizing original content, and they've signed up a lot of uh, you know, celebrities and unique podcasters to just be available on their podcasting service for a $7.99 monthly subscription. But will they, you know, be able to really break that market? There are already two other subscription markets, uh, models, the Stitcher with $4.99 a month and Wondery for $5 a month, and of course, a lot of free podcasts. This was interesting this past week before I left New York, the subway was covered with advertisements for Luminary. So everywhere it's original podcasts with original idea for original people. And in China's audio market, they often talk about FOMO, fear of missing out. And so they have a $7.3 billion market where it's basically online education through audio. And it's exciting for us to watch from you know, the States and from Europe to see what works for them because they really are able to do this micropayment. When you have a podcast you really like, you'll, the Chinese will pay for that only and they'll tip uh, different podcasters who they like to listen to. One of the popular podcasts in China is how to make your voice more attractive for the China market where so many people are coming from the countryside with their own uh, area regional accent and want to speak more like the Beijing or Shanghainese. And in comparison to the US, where we're doing mostly advertising, they've been able to uh, bring in quite a bit of money through audiobooks and downloads, 400 million downloads, for their sharing of knowledge content. And they have a $2.3 billion evaluation just for Shimalaya FM, their biggest online audiobook conglomerate. That again, you can't really get details of the sales from them. 
But high, China's highly regulated, unlike the US and Europe, where you could actually create content and put it up on a website. In China, they control having access to websites and servers, and you have to go through a lengthy process to be able to create your own. So of course, if you are interested in podcasting and do want to do your own more personal mission-driven podcast, you do tend to turn to these services like Shimalaya, where you can just pay them and they upload your podcast. Of course, the problem is they make money off advertising and they will rate their own content above yours. And in, in 2019, China has invested in the US podcasting space. They've created Himalaya Media, which is a freestanding company based in San Francisco. Again, they're saying they've brought in $100 million worth of investment. And they have, they're working on a tipping model. So we'll be interested to see in the US if this really works that well, because people aren't that used to paying small amounts on their phone, which is why it works so well in China. But they are setting it up as a separate company. And of course, it makes sense. Uh, the US and China, you might have heard, is having a very tense period. Uh, so there's a lot of suspicion of all things Chinese right now in the United States. Variety noted they might also want to distance themselves from the Chinese company, because the Chinese company just launched a smart speaker targeted at the members of the Chinese Communist Party, which is not good for publicity in the States. And where are we going in the future of audio? Of course, there'll be more inventive original content and productions, more celebrity voices and great voices as narrators, testing different business models, subscriptions, micropayments, tipping, single purchase, aggregation of audio and podcast companies for growth, and greater content integration with social media, innovations in voice SEO will be a big area, and distribution channel improvement for consumer ease and adoption will continue. As we all hope, of course, authors and publishers and disruptors will continue to innovate to bring the magic of storytelling to evolving transmedia channels that fit our more hectic lives. Thank you.